that came up through undergraduate and even graduate schools and the most remarkable artistic events that I participated in with a visiting artist to come to. And you may notice that we have a number of shows in the gallery and some may, opportunities may or may not present themselves to the, uh, to the opportunity to interact with the, the artist per se, but the Edwards Scholarship uh, is a much more high power presentation and we have tried to cultivate a little more uh, interactive situation with, with that. But Howard Sherman is a nationally known artist. Uh, he's definitely recognized in the state of Texas as being one of the highest powers in the area of painting uh, that are around in new contemporary painting. It's been profiled several times in New American Painting, a publication, and it was selected for the uh, 210, 2010 uh, Texas Artist Today. And uh, you may notice that the publication Texas Abstract, which features uh, Mr. Sherman's painting on the cover, is available in the uh, gallery itself. And you may, I invite everyone to have an opportunity to look through that. You'll see some of the leading examples of painting images uh, going on in the state, if not the country. And that's, of course, Texas Abstract, which features Mr. Sherman's painting on the cover. Uh, we have uh, uh, in his resume several museums, uh, collections that uh, Mr. Sherman is in. And he's on permanent display in the Bush Intercontinental uh, Airport in Houston. Uh, we have group exhibitions represented under Mr. Sherman's name, including the states across the country, in Texas, California, New York, Spain, India, and Peru. So there's an international recognition here. And we have a, a lot of uh, solo uh, exhibitions across the United States. Uh, and uh, Mr. Sherman's done residencies in Virginia and Vermont, like me and Santa Fe, too. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Sherman has been around and done a lot of things in this, just the last short few years right out of graduate school. So, to get an idea of what needs to be done to sort of break into the art world, Mr. Sherman would be a really good resource for that. Also, uh, uh, Howard has a lot of experience in the graphic art world. We have a lot of graphic illustrators, graphic commercial art people. He's got experience in there as well and uh, could provide a lot of valuable information. But in the meantime, we're going to be looking at really what's putting him across in the art world, and that, of course, is the area of painting, which is what the Edward Scholarship is all about. He'll be the judge for the scholarship for the painting uh, on canvas, as well as the uh, watercolor components of the Edward Scholarship. And that, of course, is uh, uh, limited to sophomores, or rather juniors and seniors, and uh, that all these people are uh, and encourage you to submit work for that. Any questions, check with faculty. Yes. Fame. Yes, and of course we have another uh, scholarship coming up as well. An opportunity at Fame Collage, which is another event that's uh, taking place. That's open to everyone to submit work for the Fame Scholarship as well. So those are two big things, two big uh, more possibilities. You saw Henry and Adrian getting rewards. Here are some more opportunities coming up. This is. Uh, got money attached to it as well. So uh, everyone's a person to participate in that. How do you build a resume? By participating in as many of these things as possible. Okay, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Howard Sherman. Thank you. In a minute, I'll we'll hit the lights. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you, um, before, before we start the whole slideshow part of it and turn the lights off, uh, I want to thank everyone for the first Foremost. Thank you for silencing your phones because it was throwing me off and I'll freak out. But um, uh, also, I wanted to thank Professor Green Clark for bringing me here and the rest of the faculty for bringing me here. Um, this has been a real thrill. I've only been here a few hours. And I've met some really interesting students already who are really engaged and, in fact, and faculty members who really care about you, students, mostly students. In the and I think it's really great. I mean, I got an immediate read on that. And that's a really special, exciting thing. Um, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and basically what's going to happen is I'm going to give a slideshow presentation. It's going to last about half an hour. The focus of the slideshow presentation is going to be on uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm going to show you a lot of my early influences, really bad early work. Like, I cringe when I look at it. Uh, things I did before graduate school, a couple of things I did in graduate school, and then the last part of my uh, talk is going to be 
um, uh, postgraduate school work, professional work, like some of which you can see next door in the gallery right here. And I encourage you to see the show. It's kind of a um, kind of a mini greatest hits of the last few years, you know, and it shows how things have changed and how much they've stayed the same. And I really didn't plan on that, but um, but it, it, it just sort of came about that way. It was really wonderful. Anyway, um, also, oh, uh, uh, I would love to take questions, but if you can hold your questions until I'm done speaking, until the end of it, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to you about things I've talked about during the slideshow, and other and other things as well. Uh, I I'm, you know, I make art. I'm, I'm based in Houston. I'm from Houston. I'm a full-time artist, and we more than happy to chat with everyone. So, uh, but please hold your questions until afterwards. So, without further ado, we'll get the party started. Thank you. I'm going to kind of stand here and work the arrow keys on the slideshow. So, um, well. I'm, uh, go ahead and turn them all off. So what's going to happen is I'm going to start, and there'll be times where I'm going to stop and point things out uh, regarding certain images, and then there's uh, there's certain images that I'll just sort of race through a little bit more quickly. Okay. And again, if there's questions about if there's, if there's questions about anything, I'll take them when we're done. Okay. Anyway, uh, the name of the show, and I guess the name of the presentation today would be called Shambolic Power. I put these images up for no good reason other than I think they're really cool. When I'm in my studio, when I'm in my studio, sometimes I'm being something other than myself in regular life. In regular life, I might look to you like a calm, mild-mannered, regular dude. And sometimes in my studio, I'm feeling like a big pimp or an angry, aged uh, rock star that some of you may or may not know who likes to flip off the bird of the world. A big salute. Um, anyway, uh, the, the idea there being, it's important to, be, to let yourself play when you're making work and to use your imagination and go outside your normal routine. Uh, we have enough rules to follow in regular life, right? Uh, a few thoughts before I begin. Uh, I think you should, when, as an artist, I think you should, maybe even as a human being, um, you should avoid uh, making well-behaved work. Uh, try and surprise yourself in the studio. Don't be boring. Stay hungry. Laugh at yourself. And number five is hugely important. If you lose your sense of humor in life, you're screwed. you got to have a sense of humor. Life has ups and downs. We're all human. So it's important to be able to laugh at yourself. And I try to remember that in the work that I make, which you'll see. And then number six, never stop hustling. you got to hustle. you got to be hungry. you got to hustle. You know, no matter what point you're at in your life. And I don't know why I put that image there. I just like, I, I like seeing the uh, wrestling. Uh, female wrestling. Okay. <laughs> so, basically, a long time ago, a previous, what feels like a previous life, I started out as a cartoonist. I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Texas at Austin, which was a studio art degree, but I spent all my time at the school paper trying to get my daily comic strip in the school paper. And it was called Follow and Couple, and I did it. And that's really where my focus was, that and just whooping it up. And uh, I mean, I, you know, everything worked out great. I went on to graduate school, and here I am today, um, a somewhat respectable member of society. But uh, anyway. That was kind of fun. I thought it was fun. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I did college and I. Um, I learned a lot, I, I really learned a lot from those days of doing this comic strip. And then after I finished college, I spent several years self-syndicating into several newspapers around the country, about 16, most of them were college dailies. And basically I got to a point in the mid-90s, I guess it was, might have been around 95 or 96, 97, where I just got, I kind of got tired of being on a daily deadline, and creatively it felt very limited. Um, what happens is whether you're looking at a comic strip in the old-fashioned newspaper or on a computer monitor, the artwork that you make is usually larger and then it gets reduced down to the size of a postage stamp. And so creatively it started to feel stifling the environment and the surrounding environment around it. I just, it wasn't fulfilling anymore. And there was really a point where um, at the end of that road in the late 90s where I was either going to sort of 
go more into comedy writing, you know, where I'm just sort of comedy writing or doing something with comedy that's more about words, or go more visual art and end up, you know, going into fine art, contemporary art, which I thought was really super cool and sexy. I thought it'd be all, you know, champagne and limousines and all that. And uh, I had anyway. That didn't, the champagne and limousines didn't happen, but the I went the I went the, the fine art route, the contemporary art route, and that sort of led me on a long path back into school. I went to graduate school, got a master's in fine arts in painting and drawing, and here I am today. Um, but you know, one of the great things about this about this experience was um, being on a daily deadline taught me discipline, and it, it taught me a really important fundamental aspect that I didn't realize until later, which is drawing. No matter what you're doing, even if some of you here can be dentists or plumbers or engineers or rocket scientists and have nothing to do with art, drawing is like a really wonderful fundamental tool that lets you kind of use your brain a little differently and see the world in a different sort of way. And I think drawing, whether you're doing printmaking or graphic design or computer animation, or it just it helps everything. You know, It's kind of like learning a language. And you don't have to be great at it, but you have to understand it. And if you start to understand it by doing it and doing it and taking a few classes, uh, you really feel like you've broaden yourself as a human being, you know? And photography does not anti-photography at all. I'm not anti-technology at all. I think they're all great. But I think that I think that's really important. And with the point being doing the comic strip was um, you know, it, it taught me to be very economical in my mark making. Not just and also really tight with my words. You know, you have this little word balloon, you've got to get your text across, you gotta get your verbal you're funny, you gotta get the humor across quickly and succinctly, but the, the mark making has to be that way too. And now, as you'll see, when you look at the rest of my artwork, and especially, I really hope you can go across the hall and take five seconds and go across the hall and really look at the work, because there's nothing, there's no substitute for the real thing, but I make a lot of really loud, noisy, bombastic paintings, but even within the context of those loud, noisy, erratic things, you see a real economy to the mark making and the drawing, and also a confidence that came out of working at it every day. It's like a muscle that you have to exercise, you know? And so that, I, I look back after doing this and realize how important it was. And also, it really, it ended up making my work feel different than the next person, and the next person, and the next person. So I was still focused on this particular way of drawing. Um, uh, in, in a way, I ended up being a little bit self-taught and untutored, even though I was officially educated, you know, uh, because my focus was on this. So here we go into early influences, and um, basically, uh, you know, I had a, I had a lot of time off in between undergrad, undergraduate, and graduate school, and I started looking at work and trying to figure things out for myself. And um, I started one of the things that one of the people that I was turned on to really early on, right before graduate school, and then dug deeper my first semester of graduate school was Philip Gustin, who started out as a abstract expressionist in the 50s, and some people would even call him an abstract impressionist, but this is the late work, and basically people said, well, you're really into cartooning, you're coming out of cartooning, and you're trying to make paintings now, contemporary art, you should look at late Philip Gustin, these cartoonish paintings. And what I realized, this was one of the first times uh, looking at this work, I realized that there's all kinds of iconography that you can use as your own symbols. So you're seeing this head, but the head comes up again and again and again, being used in different ways. And those shoe, those shoe soles become metaphors for your own soul. And he stacks them up sideways. And so what starts happening is I start realizing, wow, all of this stuff that I'm used to thinking about like one way, like my shoes, is this functional object I literally put on my foot, start to become metaphors and symbols for other things. And it kind of and that's when things slowly started to um, unfold in a, in a more interesting, unusual way for me. And I realized you can be, you can say things without being so literal all the time. And sometimes that opens up the discussion for all kinds of other interpretations and the viewer can use their imagination. Does that make sense what I just said? You know? And that, my friends, is a really cool thing, right? Stories don't always have to be so literal or overt or blatant. <coughs> They can, they can be guideposts that let you 
jump in and get on and off the ride when you want and bring your own interpretation to it. Um, but the key is, is making it very, making it, uh, very uh, specific in your intention and convincing. And that's the trick you, you got to try and pull off when you're making your own contemporary artwork, I think. But anyway, uh, the other important thing that came around with, with this, this work that, that I really digested over a very long period of time was the work, I started to realize that these paintings make a sound. And the sound that most of this late Gustin work makes is actually a slow moan, and to, for me. And although they're playful and cartoony, if you see them in person, and you see, especially if you can see several of them in person, they moan, quite frankly, with a bit of despair, you know? And they're made with slow, buttery brush strokes, which is really kind of hard to see in this image, but he does, he's got these slow, buttery brush strokes. And like the way my hand's moving here, if y'all can see it, I can guarantee you he made it work like that and not like not like that. And so everything about this had a slow moaning sound to it. So I started to think about what if I slowly started to think about, well, if my work makes a sound, what kind of sound would my work make? And that became really important to me. And I started to slowly realize, you know, art and music and film and these things are we're, we're using different tools to get to a very similar place. And that became a really important thought. As simple as it sounds for me to say that to you now, when I was developing as a young artist, I didn't have a clue. It took me a while. I had to keep pushing at it and investigating, you know. But once I had that kind of a moment, things started to really unfold in a wonderful way. And, um, you know, artwork, visual art can make sounds and, and, and music can have texture like a painting or a sculpture or... You know, so, I mean, it all starts to spill into one another, you know. You start to think about the actor in the movie you're watching a little bit differently when you start to really become cognitive uh, or co conscious of that thought. Here's another guy like, uh, I was looking at. This guy was actually my professor at, when I was an undergrad at UT, Peter Saul. And one of the things I liked about this work, again, an entry point, the, door, the front door that opened up for me was, here's a guy making paintings using cartoons. He's doing it in a more tuned up way. Um, one of the things I liked is he gave me, a lot of these artists gave me permission to do things, and I needed permission at that time, because I was still learning. I didn't know what I was doing, you know? And so he gave me permission to um, uh, basically be disturbing, let all my emotions out, happy, sad, angry, freaky, bizarre, perverse. It didn't matter. You can put it into your artwork. You clearly, he's clearly doing it here, you know? And that... I needed someone to sort of give me that permission to be that way. It's not like I was terribly repressed before that, but I just didn't, I didn't know, you know? And so very early on, I was looking at his work. I did class with him in school, which was really interesting. Uh, we didn't have a tremendous amount of interaction, but it was still really interesting nonetheless. And then from a historical standpoint, this is where I started to realize why wow, you can also incorporate a lot of different sort of art history in your work. And he... He was using a very indirect way. He was using surrealism, early 20th century surrealism, even though this is a living contemporary artist. Completely different. I also started looking at Mark Rothko. There's a Rothko poster and some other amazing posters in this room that I, you should check them out. There's some really great artwork in this room, but there's that, that one with the, the yellow, red, blue triangles on the back wall. Uh, I, I actually really early on was looking at Rothko and in a weird way, he, he gave me permission to um, use maroon and burgundy, a color that I was always really attracted to, but never... It's actually kind of a complicated, sophisticated cousin of red, which I was talking to one of the students earlier today. It's a very challenging color to work with in abundance in a, in a painting, or any kind of artwork, I think. But, you know, there was something seductive about the way he was applying the paint to the canvas, the burgundies, the maroons, uh, the symbolism of those colors. A lot of times in TV, in TV and film, you don't see bright lights flirting out of somebody's body. The blood is feels maroon or whatever, depending on the depending on your the, um, you know how well tuned your monitor is. But but, but the, the fact of the matter is is these these paintings also the way they were made started to become important. I mean, I realized mark making isn't just about literal drawing a mark. But this, this sort of feathered edges of the rectangle, Jerry Salt's a famous art critic who would call these fuzzy Buddhist TVs. So 
This is one of the first times I saw drawing and mark making used in a way in a way that uh, went somewhere more spiritual, maybe. And I live in Houston, and there's a Rocco Chapel in Houston. Those aren't my favorite Roccos, but the idea behind them and the space and all this, I started to realize in a very distilled way, the way you make your marks can also be really important. It can lead you to kind of a ethereal, spiritual place. Or, uh, and that's what the critics write about when they write about this work a lot. So I thought that that was really interesting. Now, I'm already going a little long. I apologize. I had that cup of coffee right before I started. So I'll try and speed up a little bit. Um, but that, 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 it was really wild to be looking at something like this, and then not that long after to really begin looking at this. And then I started looking at stuff like this. Um, this is a San Francis. Uh, I like this example because there's a lot of negative space around the blue positive shape. And it also has quite a figurative reference. But here I start getting a pre uh, permission to sort of use dripping as a mark making device, right? Um, dripping and, and then even staining. Here comes a eureka moment. I was uh, in New York, I was in grad school, I was in New York for the weekend for a friend's wedding or something, and I saw this painting in a book, in a book in a bookstore in Brooklyn, and there's other woman paintings by Lone de Kooning that are more, a little bit more famous, but this one, the image that I saw, and this isn't a great image of it, but the image that I saw really showed me how you can make this sort of gruesome-ish, cartoonish figure, but get a little bit more gestural and powerful with, uh, with the paint at the same time. It just, there was a physicality to this piece that I really responded to and hit me in the right place at the right time in my development. And as I became more technically capable late in later years, I was able to employ that idea in my own work. Uh, I'm going to jump up backwards and forwards a little bit. This is a this is a Goya piece, and here's a couple of Francis Bacon's. Very powerful work. And again, what happened with this work was it gave me it gave me permission to um, to really. Uh, get very emotive in my work, you know. Uh, one of the things that I really, that I, again, that I was, it was a slow, slowly digesting thing, but it gave me permission to just really uh, let all kinds of power and emotion come out in the work, even rawness. And another thing I liked about, about Bacon's work in particular was there were subtle nods to early 20th century surrealism in the work. I liked the way he used space and kept things simple. There's a simple geometry in the background. And I watched an interview with him while I was in graduate school, and one of the things that he mentioned was he really wanted to make the, the mouth of his figures uh, as beautiful as any landscape painting. And I thought that that was a really powerful thing, even titled a painting, Your Mouth is the Ultimate Landscape, based on that interview that I've watched. And I thought that was really interesting. I also think that there is sort of a, a bit of a, 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 there's a crudeness to his work, but there's also a, an indirect, a very indirect, unusual sophistication to his work. And, that, and, and even though sometimes they seem really simple, they're actually deceivingly complex. And he's a, he's a very hard artist to imitate. And uh, I, once in a while I see someone trying to make something that looks like this and they have a very hard time pulling it off. And then, so here's a, in the last couple of years, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, in the last couple of years I've, had, I've grown to be really fond again of Lake Picasso, simply because he makes it, he synthesized everything that he'd done that had come before him with this work, and he makes it look so effortless and easy, and it's so, every mark, you know, his drawing chops are just phenomenal, and he's just letting it all flow, he makes it look like he's letting it all flow out of him, but it's incredibly purposeful, and um, I've been really into it. I'm going to jump back just a little. Late grad school, I was looking, I was also looking at uh, Julie Maritou and Matthew Ritchie quite a bit. Um, the thing that really appealed to me about this work was the sound it made was very explosive, although very controlled and precise and labored. And it, it, it felt like a kaboom, blam, you know. So if these sorts of artists made a sound, it would be that kind of a sound. And just a, a real marriage of that kind of sound with robust at, at, at all over abstraction. It's almost like a uh, it's a Pollock painting in some place very contemporary um, and architectural and graphic. Um, and then uh, uh, someone else who's a little more recent is Albert Owen. 
is a, I think either Austrian or German contemporary artist. And he's very, what I like about it is he seemed to be very resourceful and risky. He makes a lot of work that I think misses, but he also makes a lot of work that I think really hits. And here you've got him like just getting really muddy with his palette and messing it up all over the place. But yet, there still is a sense of order and structure to the painting, especially in the negative space around all the white areas, the upper left, upper right, upper lower left, upper right, <coughs> lower right, sorry. Uh, uh, someone else worth looking at. And here comes another big one, someone I visit a lot and I've lectured about in Houston. Uh, I, one of the things that I really loved about this work was um, there's just such an honesty and a poetry to the mark making. And if you look closely, all of these are little, these are, these are, these are boats that he's drawn that are taken from Greek mythology. I believe they're boats from the dead or boats for the, um, they symbolize, uh, I think boats for the dead or something, but they're, they're meant to be boats. And, um, but, but whenever you're, um, when you're looking at a good Twombly, they just feel so poetic and honest. And there's such a direct line of thought between the hand, like an unfiltered, there's almost like an unfiltered, a good twombly is like an unfiltered um, documentation between uh, the brain or the hand and the page without, without, too, without, without too much um, analysis put into it. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. You know, they just feel so unencumbered and honest and, and naked, quite frankly. Um, and someone else later uh, kind of does an urban, or, or work from that, from this point in time, was doing kind of an urban take on Twombly for a while. I've been looking at her a little bit lately, uh, when you like. So, early work before graduate school. I hope some of y'all will still say hello to me after the lecture because some of this is not very good. <laughs> but I didn't know what I was doing, so uh, I'm going to go through these quickly. I, I started trying to paint again after not painting for many years. I started trying to find stock photography images off the internet. This is, this is around 99, 2000, 2001, and playing with them. Kind of teaching myself how to paint again after not really having done it in a very long period of time. And then, uh, this is around 2001, I start to try and get a little bit less specific, a little less referential or representational with the work, and I start trying to make these sort of more scrawling symbols, and, you know, I'm thinking about the symbolism of Dustin again. Man, this sucks. <laughs> but what's interesting about this piece is that there's a lot of things going on in this that are still happening in my work today. From 20 feet away, my work unfolds one way. It's almost kind of bombastic. And then you get 20 inches away, and you see a lot of little doodles and iconography and scrawls. And those are already starting to happen in the background of this work. So there's a real intimacy uh, to that. And they unfold over a period of time. The more time you spend with the work, especially like even the newer work that's in the gallery here, the more you'll see that. Um, here I am, this is around that time, 2002, I believe, 2002, this is right before grad school, and I start trying to employ a lot of that iconography and symbolism in unusual ways. The credit card for the head. I was doing little drawings at that time, you know. Still trying to figure it out. Pretty confident with the way I'm drawing, but not really sure what to do. Here's another ridiculous one. Here's some grad school work. This is the first semester of grad school, so I, I went in and I kind of knew I wanted to continue working with cartoons, but I was starting to learn a lot more about our stripe as a reference to the Barnett Newman zip paintings. There's a big Newman show about to open at the Manila Collection in Houston. I'm sure it'll be good. A lot of raw canvas in this piece, which I was seeing a lot in Francis Bacon's work and even Clifford Still at the Fort Worth Modern when I visited there while I was in school. And I liked, I, I didn't realize why yet, I couldn't verbalize it yet, but I liked the physicality of the material on the raw canvas and the physicality of the paint. Here's another one. This was in New American Paintings, and here's another one from New American Paintings. And these were, I did these in grad school too. Here I start thinking about cubism a little more and fracturing the geometry within the figures and flattening it out and giving myself permission to have a lot of negative space, which is something I really would never have been able to do before. And here we go to professional work. This is a real big painting. It's 110 inches tall and 90 inches wide. And here you really see me start to just handle paint differently, more confidently. You know, there's a beautiful big maroon stain in the lower half of the painting. 
And I still remember making, it's actually, it looks black there, but it's actually a dark brown. It's almost like a chocolate drizzle across the top of the painting. And I'll never forget standing over this giant painting in, a, in my studio and making that. And it just, if you ever, it just felt like things kind of snapped, you know, clicked. It was this, there was a really wonderful moment that I still, that I still remember. Um, you can even see like a little bit of that sort of light blue hand shooting the finger, which comes up again here. Again, staining and material. Here's the cover of the catalog for I have a solo museum show a couple years after I got out of school called Eating and Friction. This is the piece that's on the cover. And there's those whirling dervish lines that, that I was still thinking a lot about Julie Meritu and Matthew Ritchie and people like that and um, incorporating that sort of stuff in the work. The key is with all of these references for me was figuring out a way to fuse them into my own recipe. I didn't want to recreate things I'd seen before. I was trying to come up with something that felt different. So the trick was to just keep working and adding and subtracting and adding and subtracting and morphing and tweaking the things I liked and I didn't like. Uh, here's a piece that the museum bought out of that show. It's in their permanent collection. And this is another really big one. It's 110 inches tall by 90 inches wide. I have a lot of fun titling them. I guess those are from my days of playing with words as a cartoonist. Uh, here's a really good example of this one. I did this a lot for a long time where I really like making these crisp, clean, sharp, vector-based lines. You see a lot of black lines at the top of that painting. And I like trying to marry that with really gestural kind of mark making, you know, loose mark making cartoonish figures and coming up with how can you marry those two types of things because they require two different types of behavior. Or in my case, there's multiple types of behavior going on in the work. And now here's where I start using spray paint. My hand starts getting in the work. All bets are off. I'm trying all different types of things. And here's another big painting. I actually still have this painting. Uh, if Angela State wants this painting. Hand, hand, hand. I'm kidding. Uh, anyway, this is the piece that's uh, at, it's in, on permanent display. The city of Houston owns this piece. It's at Bush Intercontinental Airport. Going down the escalator, if you're going to Terminal D or Terminal E, sometimes they move it. Uh, here's a black and white painting. I've uh, done a couple of these. They're actually very challenging to make them work. And then I did a whole body of work where I did a whole, a whole bunch of gold and black paintings. And I thought it would go quick and be easy because I wasn't working with a lot of color. I made them basically monochromatic, right? And then towards the end, it got very, very challenging. Um, uh, here's some more work. This one's in the show. Some get more figurative, like more overtly figurative, like that, and that, which is on the uh, banner on the front of the building. And in the show, I love this painting. It's a very distinctive, unique painting. I like the fact that so many different blotches of color are sectioned off, but, but the drawing, I think, fuses the piece together in a peculiar way. And I love the fact that this painting freaked out this little old lady in the gallery. She thought it was so disturbing, she started yelling at me. And that was just like, <laughs> I floated on air for a week after that. That was great. Uh, this is one of the pieces in the book that just came out. This art history book that Professor McClark mentioned. Uh, uh, I feel very flattered. Uh, it's, an, it's a beautifully done art history book. And to be on the cover of it and have work like this in it is just really great. Um, the, the, and I know a lot of the artists in the book, and they're really outstanding artists. A lot of them from Houston and Dallas. I spent a lot of time up in Dallas, too. Uh, and, and both in this one, and in this one, and in this one, I'm thinking about building the painting off a grid, off a pretty organized, solid grid, you know? And I thought that, that would, that's an interesting device to, to try and get messy and loose on that, so that sort of foundation. So the point being is a lot of this work has a very structured organization to it, even though it looks, sometimes it looks pretty slapdash or finished really quickly. Um, I'm going to the last few minutes, so bear with me. Um, Another thing, I did this at a residency. At the, I was at a, a World Sur Foundation in Taos, New Mexico in 2012. I did this piece. Things are getting really, there's ever so slightly starting to get more loose and gestural um, and, and trying to be a little more spontaneous. All the while, I'm doing these small works on paper that are starting to collage more. And I'm realizing collage, cutting out other works on paper and other things, 
as a mark making device and a drawing tool is starting to become more and more important. And I'm becoming more and more interested in the physicality of, uh, of the material that I'm working with. And in 2013 to present, this next body of work, I'm conscious of the surface and I start giving myself permission. And so if you notice, the black area in the middle is paper pop popping several inches up off the surface of the piece. And I'm getting more and more interested in, in that tactile sculptural components of the work, yet still really wanting to make two-dimensional paintings and drawings. Uh, everything's getting rougher, or even the brushwork's getting rougher. There's a brand new little one that's currently at a, at a little show at a Blue Orange Contemporary in Houston. That's up through Saturday. There'll be a closing reception. And another artist talk on Saturday there. Uh, this is another one. This is a giant piece, or a pretty large piece, and it comes like nine inches off the surface, the black areas and the tangerine orange areas. Metaphysical Batman, that's also in the book, and I have no idea if that piece is in New York or on its way to Houston or on its way to Oakland right now, and hopefully I'll find out tonight. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is another, this is really important work. I mean, there's the, the surfaces become very sculptural and it's protruding 15 inches off the surface. Uh, this is on the cover of the book and in the book. This one also is like, you know, the figurative references become more details and less overt, which is real important. And a real play between glossy black and more matte or more matte finish iridescent gold throughout the whole piece with all those slivers of Gatorade lemon lime green. That's all paper. Although it's 13 inches on the surface, I started to make paper look like metal or steel or aluminum in some of them. And that became important for a while. Here's brand new paintings. And so now I'm making paintings again where I'm cutting up old paintings and tearing up old canvas and collaging back into the surface. And the surfaces are actually four or five inches sometimes. They're coming up. They're not quite as extreme as the paper stuff. But there's still, there's still a lot of canvas and stuff coming off the surface. As you can see in the upper part of that one, and there's pieces of canvas adhered to that one, things buckle and fold over. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, question. So, in your show, in the gallery there, I spent quite a bit of time in front of the Unique Hotel. I found it really beautiful as an object, but really confusing as a communication. So I was wondering if, is that too personal a question? What, what's behind that? What inspired it? What inspired? I mean, I don't really wait for inspiration. It's a Chuck Close quote that says, inspiration is for amateurs. I gotta get to work. I mean, I'm, I'm really, I don't know if the sense is in that. I'm just working. I can't wait to be inspired. I have work to do. I just show up every day and work. And as far as that one goes, that's one of the first pieces I did. It's one of the first paintings I did um, about 14, 15 months ago when I started painting again after the paper pieces. The big paper pieces I was showing you, where I was collaging uh, pieces of canvas and sort of painted on rough canvas in the work. And so that might have been the first one. So now I was thinking about that. I was thinking about with that particular piece, I wanted it to feel really pretty, kind of dirty and nasty in just the right way. You know, I didn't want it to be so disgusting you want to look at it, but I wanted to, want it to tickle, tickle you inappropriately, so to speak. You know, that, that particular piece. So that, that, those were thoughts that were on my mind while I was making it. Of course, sometimes you don't realize this stuff until you have a healthy distance when you and finishing that particular piece, but those were those things were on my mind with that one. Oh, sure. 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 No, and I just kind of like that title. You know, sometimes the titles have nothing to do with the work. I just have I have all these titles in the studio. I have lists and lists, and sometimes the titles have everything to do with the work, and sometimes they have nothing to do with the work. I just think boutique hotel sounds like a cool title. Like I could see one of y'all walking around with a t-shirt that says Boutique Hotel and feeling really cool about it, you know? So. And Boutique Hotels have become kind of cool again, I guess. Or maybe they've always been cool, I don't really know. 
I don't really care. But, you know, everything's boutique and everything's customized. We can get whatever we want exactly how we want it, including hotels. You know. But anyway, so I hope that answered your question. Yeah. I was going to open with a knock knock joke today. I couldn't think of anything. I thought that would be stupid. <laughs> so I just jumped right into it. I think I even told Professor Rick Clark I was going to do that. Sorry, y'all. My material, I need to get my material together. I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. Next time. Well, not a ding dong joke. It's always, it's always knock knock. Yeah, I don't know any ding dong jokes either, but feel free to share them with the group, man. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, I have two questions. Um, one, when you showed the smart process training, and I wondered if you can comment upon the spiritual significance that you find in your painting. Is it the processing, or is there images there that you put in, or why did you use them as a reference? And my second question, uh, can you describe your daily work routine as a professional artist? Yeah. Okay, as far as the first question goes, and we, I mean, if you feel like looking at the poster in the back, that's cool, but I can also, um, let me, let me uh, bring his up again with the lights on, but he's talking about this, this artist. Can we see it or? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, as far, as far as, as far as that goes, Oh, I'm sorry, it's not working totally it's, right. It's because you have a black background, that's why. Oh, okay, but thank you. Yeah. Well, we get the idea, but anyway, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, so basically what happened with this artist was I was reading criticism about this artist, and a lot of it was related to the spiritual components of the work and the way the work's been placed in that context. And I was living a couple of miles away from this, this Rock Manil, you know, the Rothko Chapel on the Manila campus. So uh, I thought about his work in that context. I don't really know if I, I don't think about my own work spiritually that often. I think about it as a healthy therapy, uh, which is maybe a, arguably a cousin of doing some sort of spiritual practice. That could be debatable. So, um, but there is. There's, there's definitely a humanity to my work that I consider more in Twombly's work or something like that, more so than this. But then the more I look at this, the more I think about that too, you know. So, as far as, uh, I don't know, I mean, I don't think of my work particularly spiritual, but I think of it as, a, as incredibly human and, and uh accessible to other human beings regardless of their cultural background or their religious background or their ethnic background and maybe indirectly through that there's some sort of a spiritual connection but that might be a bit of a reach um, so I, I don't really have a great answer to your question but I do know that his work has been documented and and, and feels to me very spiritual part maybe part of that because it's mostly very calming you know and you don't have to make calm work or spiritual work, but we tend to be in a more spiritual zone, if you will, when we're in a calm mood. That's probably why your church, mosque, or synagogue isn't painted hot pink with a disco ball at the top. You know, they want you to kind of chill and be reflective, I guess. And that's definitely what happens with this stuff. So, and that's not happening with my stuff. And, you know, not all artwork can be everything to everyone, and certainly isn't a complete profile of my personality 24-7, maybe 23 no. Anyway, uh, another bit. Man, I really got to work this stuff out before I come here. I thought I had a couple of killer jokes. Anyway, uh, and then as far as the other, as far as what you were saying about, um, as far as what you were saying about uh, my work routine, my work routine is pretty similar. Yeah, I work all the time. Uh, I tend to, uh, I tend to get up uh, and spend most mornings in front of the computer or dealing with phone calls, uh, more so now than I did before because I've, I'm, I've broken up with a couple of galleries recently, so I'm doing more of that stuff myself than, I, than I've ever done before. I'm still working with galleries, but there's a couple of them that I'm no longer working with, and so I'm doing more of that, so I'm spending more time on the business and the marketing side than I did before, but I was always having to spend a lot of time on that. 
because that's the nature of it. There's a romantic cliche that you just check out by your island and go make your art and the world comes to you. That's not, that's not reality, that's fantasy. And even if you're a super famous brand name, uh, they're still hustling. You know, I talk to gallerists who represent some of the most ultimate famous artists in the world, and they're still hustling. And one of the things they do that's really clever is they hide that or they make you feel like they're not, which is, you know, part of it. But I'm here to be open and honest with y'all. That's why they brought me here. It's a, it's a real hustle. And then I tend to go to the studio late morning, early afternoon, work out work throughout the afternoon, into the early evening, hopefully with as few interruptions as possible. And then have a, a little bit of a life before and after that, you know. Um, but that's pretty much my daily routine. I actually work, I, I don't really take days off, I work all the time. And that's what it needs to happen if you're going to really make something happen in the art world. Engineer or nurse or whatever, circus clown, I don't know. I mean, I'm working all the time, it's pretty much that kind of a routine. And that's what works for me. I chip away at things. I don't cram. I have a show coming up. There's not a lot of cramming. Uh, if I have to turn the show in, the art handlers are picking up the work. The work's going to be delivered on the 15th of the month. I'm not cramming from the 7th to the 14th. That's just not... Some people work better that way. Um, a lot of people like to say they work better that way. I don't think most people work better that way. Um, it's another romantic notion. I kind of chip away every day. And I come up for everything at the end of the month or a semester, a quarter, a year, and I've got a plenty of work. I've got four shows up right now. Never been this busy. The first quarter of 2015, I had like four shows up all around Texas and work shipping out all over the country. I've never been this busy, but I had plenty of really good work ready to go because I work at it every day. You know, no one caught me with my pants down. I know so many other artists who finally get opportunities after years and years of being un unrecognized and not noticed, they finally get two or three opportunities that come together sometimes really quickly, even overnight, just the way life is, and they're not ready, you know? So, I hope I didn't ramble off on that, but I'm a big believer in treating it like exercise. you got to work out consistently multiple days a week, otherwise it's not going to really work. You know, doing this sort of thing isn't gonna, it's not going to work. You have to really have discipline, self-discipline.